The relativity of time, for which we moderns may think to credit Einstein's discovery, was known of to multiple ancient cults and cultures. Chronologically, we must mention first the Catholic and early Bronze Age Sumerians from the south of modern-day Iraq and Saudi Arabia during the Uruk period around 4000 to 3100 BC who maintained a legend about seven antediluvian sages, the Apkalu, that were sent by the Anunnaki, god of the city of Eridu, named Enki, called also Ea. From fragmentary tablets found in Asher of the late second millennium BC and from Kassite period 14th century BC, Tel El Amarna, we learn of Adapa, a son of Enki, from the now yet lost city of Dilmun. First of these seven Apkalu sages, and who served as priest of the Aiapsu temple in Eridu. The Apkalu were described as being partially paradu fish, probably carp, and Adapa as being a great fisherman. One day, his story goes, he was fishing when the southwest wind, whose Anunnaki god was called Pazuzu, happened by and accidentally capsized him. Adapa, in his anger, then broke the wings of Ninlil, the south wind, and cursed Pazuzu. For this, Pazuzu brought a civil suit against Adapa before Anu, then king of the Anunnaki pantheon, and Adapa was called to testify before Anu. Enki, Adapa's patron deity, advised Adapa not to imbibe any food or drink while he was in the Anunnaki pantheon's native realm, for it would be as poison to him. However, Anu, from sympathy for Adapa following his impassioned testimony, offered Adapa the food and drink of immortality instead. But, being loyal to Enki's warning, Adapa refused to partake. A similar story derives from the Gupta period, 4th century AD, Sanskrit epic poem, the Mahabharata, written down by Vyasa, whom had been the sage Apantara Tamas in his last life and was as Vyasa, the grandson of the wandering sage Parashara, who is credited with being the author of the first Purana, Vishnu Purana. The events described in the Mahabharata, however, antedate its authorship by some 600 years, stemming from Iron Age India in the 10th century, around 1100 BC. In the Mahabharata, King Rayavata Kakudmi is described, who was able to take his daughter Rivati with him and travel to Brahma Loka, the plane of existence where the Creator resides, to confer with Brahma directly. However, when Kakudmi and Riyata arrive, Brahma was engaged in attending a symphony by the Gandharvas, male nature spirits, some part bird or horse, who guarded the Soma and served as messengers between gods and men. So the father and daughter politely waited for 27 Chatur Yugas, each a cycle of four Yugas, totaling 108 Yugas, until the performance ended. 
Brahma then explained that, while they waited in Brahma Loka, such a long time had passed in their own world that all their friends and family had already grown old and died. Upon the returning of father and daughter to their homelands, the Bhagavata Purana describes they found the race of men had become dwindled in stature, reduced in vigor, and enfeebled in intellect. Although the Book of Watchers, an astronomical book, contained in the apocryphal Gospel of Enoch, the antediluvian Hebrew patriarch and great-grandfather of Noah, were likely finalized only as early as the 3rd century BC. The Book of Dreams, which describes an allegorical history of Israel until the period of the Maccabean Revolt from 167 to 160 BC, might not have been composed until then. Again, however, the events described in the work are antedated long prior to its probable era of actual authorship and involve a canonically biblical character supposedly from prior to the Mesopotamian flood. In the Enochian Book of Watchers and Book of Dreams, Enoch is transported out of his body and shown a vast vista of geography and a very long duration of time, both compressed into a series of brief visions wherein Enoch is able to travel and perceive events occurring much faster than in his usual waking body. The Archangel Uriel provided Enoch with an annual calendar based on astronomical observations and measurements of the surface of the earth that was 364 days long. 12 months of 30 days each, plus 4 holidays, and that was being used to mark the Jubilee festivals by the Essene sect at Qumran around the 3rd century BC. Whether the Book of Enoch is authentically antediluvian in origin, as maintained to this day by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, or not, it does present a very detailed description of a series of events we might consider, in modern terms, as alike an extraterrestrial abduction. The ability to accurately interpret dream symbolism, alike the later prophets of Israel, appears to be a unique aspect of the apocryphal Enochian literature, which should also be placed in the Hebrew Merkaba literary tradition along with the stories of Jacob's Ladder and Ezekiel's Wheels, wherein are described the ascent of the soul and descent of angels amidst the hierarchy, later described in great detail in the Zohar. Lastly, among the time travel type of literary genre from works about times prior to the lifetime of Christ in Pythagorean year zero. We come to 7th or 6th century BC, Greek seer and philosopher poet Epimenides, whom, according to 3rd century AD biographer of the Greek philosophers, Diogenes Laertius, in his work Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, Book 1, Point 109 to 115 was tending sheep near his home in Gnosis on the Isle of Crete when he wandered after a stray but unable to find it fell asleep in a cave of Mount Ida sacred to Zeus when Epimenides woke according to Diogenes 57 years had passed and Epimenides found his younger brother was, by then, an old man. Epimenides, then a contemporary of Pythagoras and Solon, is credited as gifted with prophecy and as a founder of Orphism. 
When he died, his skin, which was covered in tattooed writing like the Greek slaves of the time, was preserved at the courts of the Euphores in Sparta. In Surah al-Kaf of the Holy Quran, a similar story is recounted about the seven sleepers of Ephesus, a group of early Christians who hid in a cave in 250 A.D. to escape the persecutions of Roman Emperor Decius, but fell into a miraculous sleep. When they awoke, some 200 years had passed, and they emerged during the reign of Theodosius II, 401 to 450 AD, to discover the whole empire had become Christian. So, whether as time dilation, as experienced by Adapa while in the court of Anu, or by Kakudmi and Rivate while in the Brahma Loka, or as time invariance, as experienced by Enoch in his prophetic visionary dreams, or even as suspended animation, cryogenic stasis, or hypersleep, as in the peculiar cases of Epimenides and the seven sleepers of Ephesus. We can find almost as many examples of differing methods and results in ancient literature for, as we can possible examples of, the time travel genre therein. Over the last aeon, since around the lifetime of Christ, the hypersleeper model has been the primary foible used to explore the premise of forward time travel and has sprung up either diffusely or independently in a wide variety of cultures around the world. In the modern state of New York, Northeast America, a Seneca native legend from an unknown date of origin, preserves a tale of a young squirrel hunter who spends a night with little people, only to discover this night lasted a whole year. In Orkney, an archipelago in the northern isles of Scotland, there is an apocryphal legend of a drunken fiddler whom passes fifty earth years in two hours while attending a party of trolls under the salt no burial mound adjacent to the ring of Brodgar, before he returned home to Stennis, a stranger. According to the Irish story of Niama and Oisin, Oisin, the female Niama's male lover, rides her magic horse back to Ireland after escaping on it with her to Tirna Nanog, land of the ever young. Upon his return to Ireland, he discovers three hundred years have passed, and when he stoops to help some men trying to move a boulder, he falls off his magic horse and ages those three hundred years while falling to the ground. The Talmudic Mishnah, Tanit 19a, states that around 60 AD, a Hebrew miracle worker named Hani Hamagal, meaning Hani the circle maker, fell into a coma concealed in a rock formation beneath a carob tree for 70 years. The length of time it takes a carob sprout to reach fruition. Then, when he awoke, no one believed his identity, so he prayed for mercy and died. Dating from the 4th century AD, the Mountain of the Rotten Axe Handle is a Chinese legend about a woodcutter named Wang Chi who ventured into the woods of Lanky Mountain and encountered two old men, the gods Bei Du, the Big Dipper, and Nandu, the stars of Sagittarius, who were seated playing the board game Go on a rock set between them. One of them gave Wang Chi something like a date 
and he fell into a trance, after waking from which he found the two old men had vanished, his axe handle had turned to dust, and he himself had grown a long beard. In the 720 A.D., Fudoki, Fortango Province, Nihon Shoki, and the man Yoshu is an Otugi Banashi, Japanese fairy tale, about Urashima Taru, a fisherman whom rescues a turtle that takes him to the Dragon Palace, Ryugo Jo, beneath or beyond the sea, and whom spends what he thinks is a few days there, returning only to find three hundred years have gone past in his world, and when he opens a forbidden origami tamatebaku box, he instantly becomes an old man. Compiled originally from the eighteen Mahapuranas of Veda Vyasa, author also of the Mahabharata, describing events in the 10th century BC, the Bhagavad Purana, written down around 1030 AD, records the story of Muchukunda, whom aided the Divas, deities, against the Asuras, demons, and was rewarded by Indra, king of the Divas, with uninterrupted sleep, following the resolution of their prolonged conflict by Hare Krishna. So Muchukunda, the warrior in heaven, where one year lasts 360 earth years, fell into a deep coma inside a cave in either Mount Girnar in the state of Gujarat or Ananthagari Hills in the state of Telangana, and was only awakened later by Kalayavan, the great Yavana warrior king, whom was burnt to ashes by Muchukunda's waking gaze for doing so. In 1800, the work by German Protestant theologian Johann Karl Christoph Nachtigal, published pseudonymously as Ottmar, called Volkssagen, German for folk tales, contained the story Peter Klaus the Goat Herd about a German goat herd from the fictional village of Sittendorf, whom while searching for strays, finds a party of gamers in the woods and, after imbibing their wine, wakes from a coma twenty years later. The German folktale Peter Klaus and the Orkney tale of Salt No informed Washington Irving's 1819 publication of his short story Rip Van Winkle from whence this ancient moral about hypersleep and time dilation appears to have entered our modern lexicon. In 1733 A.D., Irish author Samuel Madden wrote the satirical work of speculative fiction, Memoirs of the Twentieth Century a dossier of diplomatic correspondences between British diplomats abroad in Constantinople, Rome, Paris, and Moscow, and a Lord High Treasurer under King George VI in London, England. In Madden's hypothesized 20th century, a Jesuit papacy under Pope Paul IX has achieved worldwide dominance with Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, King Louis the Nineteenth of France, large estates in Africa, China, and Paraguay, all beholden to rule from a unified Italy. Constantinople has fallen to Tartar rule, and Russia has become expansionist as well, annexing Finland, Poland, and parts of Persia and Turkey. 
Memoirs is the first work in which information from the future is imagined as being accessible in the past. Madden has his narrator attribute this method of writing, news from the future, to being delivered the articles in the figurative past by his personal guardian angel. A similar motif, a good fairy, was used to explain the phenomenon of forward time travel in the 1781 work Anno 7603 by Johann Hermann Wessel, Danish-Norwegian poet and playwright, wherein Leander and Julie, the plot's main characters, are transported to a distant future where Amazonian gender roles prevail and only women are soldiers. The 1836 work by Russian novelist Alexander Veltman, called in Cyrillic, Predki Kalamarosa, Alexander Filipovich Makedonsky, or in English, The Forebearers of Kalamaros, Alexander, son of Philip the Macedon, uses a hippogriff, a fictional zoomorph combining the front of an eagle with the hind of a horse, as the MacGuffin that enables backward time travel to forward the plot line. In this work, the narrator meets Aristotle and Alexander the Great and accompanies the latter on a military mission and then returns to his home in the 19th century. Another backwards time travel tale from this era was published anonymously in the 1838 Dublin Literary Magazine as the short story Missing One's Coach an Anachronism, in which the narrator waits beneath a tree in Newcastle upon Tyne, northeast England, for the coach out of town, but is inexplicably transported, perhaps via dream, although it is not specified backwards in time over 1,000 years. He contacts the Venerable Bede, 672 to 735 AD, then an English monk at the Monastery of St. Peter and its companion Monastery of St. Paul in the Kingdom of Northumbria of the Angles, contemporarily Monkwormouth, Jarrow Abbey in Tyne and Ware, England, and attempts to explain to him the events of the coming centuries. In the early 1800s A.D., the aforementioned American author, Washington Irving, brought the legend of the hypersleeper into the modern age with his work, inspired by the contemporary popularity of Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, called in turn Rip Van Winkle, and in the middle 1800s came another comparable classic of Western literature, apparently featuring time invariants alike in the apocryphal Book of Enoch. English author Charles Dickens' 1843 novella, A Christmas Carol. In this work, the anti-hero and recalcitrant protagonist, elderly miser Ebenezer Scrooge, is haunted by four apparitions on Christmas Eve. The ghosts of his former business partner, Jacob Marley, the ghosts of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas yet to come. Modeled ostensibly on the Hindu Trimurti pantheon, Brahma the Creator, Vishnu the Preserver, and Shiva the Destroyer, but with distinctly Western characteristics, such as the Grim Reaper standing in for the role of Shiva as Christmas yet to come. Yet another, clearly backwards, time travel story was the 1861 book Paris Avant la Homme's Paris Before Men by the French botanist and geologist Pierre Boitard, published posthumously, in which the protagonist is transported to the prehistoric past by a lame demon, a French pun on Boitard's own name, where he encounters and interacts with the plesiosaur and an ape-like pre-human ancestor. In 1881, two works about time travel were released that would change the face and set the tone 
for almost all works of this burgeoning science fiction subgenre to follow. Edward Everett Hale, an American Unitarian minister, published his short story, Hands Off, about an unnamed being, possibly the soul of someone recently deceased, it is left unspecified, whom interferes with ancient Egyptian history, preventing Joseph's enslavement, and thereby creating an alternate history in a parallel timeline. This was the first literary work to propose this now commonplace trope of backwards time travel theory. The New York Sun Daily Newspaper published in that same year, 1881, the short story by Edward Page Mitchell, the Sun's editor, called The Clock That Went Backward, about two boys who find that when they reverse the rotation of the hands on their Aunt Gertrude's antique 16th century clock, the flow of time is reversed, allowing the boys to time travel to Leiden, South Holland, in the 1500s, to help relieve the Spanish siege there that occurred at that time. Although a machine, a clock, is used to allow backwards time travel to occur, its method of working is not explained, and so this story remains only a precursor to the first tale of a true time machine. The first tale of a true time machine, that is, a mechanical vessel for transporting a person's biological body both backward and forward through time, was published in 1887 in Barcelona, Spain, by Spanish diplomat Enrique Gaspari Rambo, and was called El Anacropiti, a neologism explained to mean who flies against time. In this work, the Anacropete is an enormous cast-iron box propelled opposite Earth's rotation by electricity, which drives four large pneumatical devices ending in tubes for travel, as well as powering other machinery, including a device that produces the Garcia fluid, or fluid of inalterability, which causes the passengers not to grow younger as they travel backward in time. Written in the format of a zarzuela, light opera, the main body of the work is made up of three primary acts, each with its own destination and adventure in past history. At the end of the third act, the protagonist, Don Sindilfu Garcia, awakens to find himself in a theater watching a play by contemporary fellow science fiction author Jules Verne, 1828-1905. For point of reference, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, which greatly popularized this concept, was not written and published until 1895, some eight years chronologically following the Anachronopete. As of the time I am writing this, in mid-October 2017, there are at least 42 films to have been released yet that deal specifically with the causality conundrum of time loops. Based largely on Einstein's 1931 grandfather paradox, in which by going back in time and killing one's own grandfather, one creates an impossible feedback loop in the time stream, where a causal paradox manifests itself as an obstacle to logic. For you to travel back in time, your grandfather lived and sired your parent who sired you. But having traveled back in time and killed your grandfather prior to his doing so, you would cease to have existed and thus could not have traveled back in time to kill your grandfather, causing yourself to cease having existed etc., etc., etc. It should be noted also, I am personally no expert on this science fiction, time travel, time loop, sub-genre. -sub 
I have only seen 15 of these around 42 films myself. Of these, however, I'd like to discuss a few in detail. La Jetée, French for the jetty, specifically referring to an outdoor viewing pier at an airport, a science fiction short film by French director Chris Marker, 1921-2012, to was released in 1962 and won the Prix Jean Vigo for short film. It is 28 minutes long, shot in black and white, and constructed almost entirely from still photos, it tells the story of a post-nuclear war experiment in time travel. The plotline of Le Jate is ultimately somewhat subjective due to its unique handling of the filmic medium. However, a general plotline can be established as such. A prisoner, played by Davon Hanich, is living underground in the Palais de Charlotte galleries in post-World War III Paris, France, and his captors use him in time travel experiments sending him back to the pre-war era where he meets and falls in love with a woman he remembered seeing once as a child on the jetty of Orly Airport when he had also seen a man die. After being sent to the far future to retrieve an energy source for the people of the post-war era, he realizes his captors mean to execute him. He is contacted by the people of the far future and asks them to send him to the pre-war past to return him to the woman on the jetty. They do so, and, just as he realizes his own younger self is present in the same crowd, he is approached by an agent of his captors, and he realizes the man he had seen die on that jetty when he was a child was actually himself now that he was older. This film also led to the 1995 American neo-noir science fiction film directed by Terry Gilliam, scripted by David and Janet Peebles, called Twelve Monkeys, under Universal Studios, and an even more recent 2015-18 TV series of the same name, produced by Atlas Entertainment, which produced the film, and Universal Cable Productions. Both the film and TV series Twelve Monkeys continue to fascinate me personally, and I mention them so briefly here only so that I may, hopefully, address them more thoroughly later on. The Butterfly Effect is a 2004 American psychological thriller slash supernatural fiction film written and directed by Eric Bress and J. Mackay Gruber inspired and influenced by the science fiction short story by American novelist Ray Bradbury, published in the June 28, 1952 issue of Collier's Magazine, called A Sound of Thunder, in which a backwards time-traveling protagonist finds he accidentally altered the distant past, resulting in at first subtle but gradually more extreme alterations to his own original timeline. Bradbury's 52 Thunder had been a contribution to the study of what has since come to be called the butterfly effect of chaos theory, which states, in essence, small causes can have larger effects. In the 04 film, starring Ashton Kutcher and Amy Smart, the protagonist discovers he has the ability to psychically regress himself into his own younger self displacing his younger self's ego. This effect had caused blackouts, missing time, and memory blocks in the childhood character, but these were thus explained as instances when the adult character was mentally inhabiting his own, younger self's body. Ultimately, the plotline is driven by the truism that altering the past results in, albeit highly unpredictable, alterations to the present, and thus, each time the main character returns to his adult self, he finds increasingly horrible repercussions awaiting him, 
having resulted from his misadventures into his own personal past. Looper is a 2012 American neo-noir science fiction thriller film written and directed by Ryan Johnson and produced by Rom Bergman and James D. Stern. In the most direct manner possible, this film cuts to the heart of what a time loop is and how it affects the psychologies and physiologies of the people it involves. Set in 2044, in a future where time travel will be invented and instantly outlawed 30 years later, and where a small percentage of the population have mutated to develop slight telekinetic capabilities, future criminal syndicates send targets for assassination back to the present in 2044, where so-called loopers are paid in solid silver bars to pull the trigger on them. When a looper eventually ends up assassinating their own older self, it is called closing their loop and pays off once in bars of solid gold. The penalties for a looper who loses his loop are, as we quickly learn, severe. Grossing $176 million in revenues on a $30 million production budget, while being nominated for 22 different international film awards, and of these winning six, five of which went to writer-director Ryan Johnson, Looper ties its science fictional strings of psychokinesis and time travel together in an elegant and efficient way using a character-driven storyline. Honorable mention in this category must include the 2014 Australian science fiction thriller film written and directed by Michael and Peter Spierig called Predestination, an adaptation of Dean of American Science Fiction authors Robert Heinlein's 1958-59 short story, All You Zombies. The plot of both the 59 short story and 14 feature-length film involves a protagonist whom we discover as the plot progresses, was born by cesarean section as a female, but after being courted, impregnated, and abandoned by an older stranger as a young woman, she suffers complications during the delivery of her baby that reveal she has both functional female and dormant male genitalia. She undergoes non-consensual sexual reassignment surgery and is made a male. The now male protagonist seeks work as a writer and eventually finds himself in a bar telling the bartender his story. The remainder of the plotline revolves around the use of time travel and trickery to lure this young male writer into the folds of the Temporal Bureau, a time-traveling secret police force that manipulates events in history. In order to better portray the premise of time travel in our cultural arts and humanities, we must better understand the science that surrounds it. And in order to better understand the science surrounding the probability of real-life time travel, we must play out scenarios involving it in our cultural arts and humanities. In this way, any topic, such as time travel, may be used to symbiotically and dialectically progress the leading edge of cultural development in relation to both the arts or humanities and to the crafts or technological sciences. In the crafts or technological sciences, the progress of Western knowledge about material reality, from Euclid to Newton, has developed a set of rules or laws of physics that govern all matter energy in the space-time continuum. However, as 20th century quantum mechanics has demonstrated, this certainty in principles cannot be applied to the subatomic size scales of particle wave packets, such as, for example, electrons and photons, existing in environments such as, for example, the quark-gluon plasma inside an atomic nucleus. 
Therefore, while such rules may apply as unbreakable laws in three-dimensional material reality, in the extra dimension of time itself, these rules and laws may not only begin to break down, but they may become inapplicable altogether. In fact, at the moment of this writing, three paradoxes are all that we know of as governing the temporal dimension. One, the ontological, predestination, or bootstrap paradox, also called a causal loop, occurs when a future event is the cause of a past event. Two, the grandfather or consistency paradox occurs when the past may be changed, thus creating a contradiction. And three, the Fermi paradox, which can be adapted for this topic, poses the question, if time travel is possible, where are all the time travelers? It should be duly noted, however, that these paradoxes are literally exact polar opposites of strict written-in-stone laws, such as those governing material physics. A paradox presupposes a causal conundrum coming into being only if and when certain conditions occur. Thus, temporal navigation must learn to steer between and around these gravity wells and mass shadows in hyperspace, that are, literally, cyclically wrapped, space-time contorted into an isomorphic knot, or, more complexly, into self-referential, fourth-dimensional hypershapes, so-called metaforms. In the arts or self-expressive humanities we can, and some would say must, contemplate a multiverse of transfinite possible outcomes and reasonably extrapolate from this loom a tapestry of only certain threads, our own personal preference settings, for a psychic filtration system, how we see the world, and then turn around and mimetically pass this pattern along to others. The role of modern artists and entertainers, whether musicians or movie directors or whomever, etc., should be re-examined in light of the ancient role of shaman or medicine man as tribal healer. After all, it will be on the theatrical stage, modern cinema screens, where we will watch our heroized unconscious archetypes play out their roles at disentangling and unfurling the standards for our collective socio-cultural future. And so, it will be in the arts and humanities where the ethical conversation about applying new technologies will be held. So, if we can use time travel, should we? It is apparent from human study of this specific field for the last 150 years or so that time travel is fraught with paradoxes. These make up the already known geographic terrain of time, and, however mercurial and ever-shifting this may be, it is possible to graph a map of time, for however fleeting and futile a moment such may last. Because we can map time, we can explore it more easily. However, before we do so, it is right we should pause to ask what we should do. Is exploring time truly something humanity should be doing? And, if so, why should we be doing so? And what are the most likely negative consequences of doing so, so that we may be prepared to counter them as or if they do indeed end up occurring? If we are able to do a thing, usually sooner or later we will do it. If we are able to physically time travel, eventually we will. So before this occurs, let us draw our maps and calculate our best course, avoiding all adverse contingencies.